With seven kids at home and a commitment to from scratch food, there is always something cooking in our kitchen. And right now is my favorite time of year to do that with all of the fresh flavors that are available. I'm gonna take you through a week and just share some of the things I am making and we are enjoying in this season. The first thing I'm doing is getting some chicken marinating. I have olive oil, a maple balsamic vinegar, some coconut aminos, which is a soy sauce alternative if you're avoiding soy, Worcestershire sauce, a little bit of Dijon mustard, maple syrup, and salt. Now, I wanna make the quick note because I, I do love cooking from scratch here. Sometimes people think this means that we never leave and I never encounter what it is to get, you know, all kinds of whatever preservatives and dyes whenever we go to maybe a grandparent's house or a party at church. And I just want to say that in those situations, I do not worry about it. I cook healthy food at home. I do source quality ingredients from quality places. I get chicken from a local farm, actually my sister's farm. I get my beef, my pork. We make sure at home to mostly prioritize healthy food from scratch food. We're not even necessarily perfect at home, but this is the, I would say the 80-20 rule definitely applies for us and I am good with the rest. It's not something I worry about like I did in the early years of motherhood where I wanted to be more perfectionist about it. Now I want to have chicken sandwiches for dinner. So I'm gonna get some sourdough hamburger buns going. You can get these going the night before and then let them ferment overnight, shape them and bake them in the morning if you want them for a breakfast or a lunch. You can put them in the fridge after you've let them do their long ferment for several days if you want to make ahead some stuff. That's a trick that I've been doing a lot lately is just getting a lot of different doughs going, get them in the fridge, label them, and then I can pull them out to just shape and bake or cook however, however it works out for the week. So for these buns, I am just going to allow them to ferment for maybe, what would this be, six, seven hours until I shape and allow them to rise a bit and bake before dinner. I'm doing a half a cup of active and bubbly starter, three quarters of a cup of warm water, three cups of flour, a quarter cup of melted coconut oil. You can also use butter, three tablespoons of honey, a teaspoon of salt, and one egg. I recently learned a trick from the homesteading family on their YouTube channel, and then I also saw it in their In the Homestead Kitchen magazine. I have an article in there. So I received the magazine and I saw this fermented mayo recipe, which I also saw Carolyn do over on her YouTube channel. This allows homemade mayo to last a lot longer. That's sort of an issue with homemade mayo. Obviously there is a raw egg in it and so it doesn't keep all that long, but if you ferment it a bit, it does. So I'm basically doing a normal mayo recipe with lemon juice, salt, an egg, and oil, but I'm also adding in sauerkraut juice. So you might've seen that I took some sauerkraut that was already fermented in the refrigerator, squeezed out a couple tablespoons of that, and then I am just doing all of the other mayo ingredients, allowing the oil to rise to the top before doing the immersion blender for it to get nice and thick. Then I'm gonna allow it to sit on the countertop for about six to 10 hours. Now, we're gonna probably be using it before that time, it'll be about six hours. So maybe after we use it, I'll just leave it out again for a little bit longer so that it can get fermented before putting it in the fridge. This will make it last longer so that I can use it in my homemade honey mustard or whatever other mayo application. We love having mayo but I do always have this like, hmm, how long has this been in here? And then I give it a smell. I'm not always the best about labeling it. And with that raw egg in there, it just is something that you can't keep for any more than probably like five to seven days. And so now I'm very glad to start fermenting all of my mayo. After about six-ish hours, the sourdough hamburger dough has risen quite a bit. So it's ready to be divided into, I do 10 parts, I used to do eight. Lately I've been doing 10 and they still end up being some nice size buns, allowing them to rise a bit and then bake them. Whenever I'm trying to accelerate something, I always put it in a warm spot. My warm spot happens to be the middle portion here of my oven. If I'm in a real big hurry, I'll turn my oven on to even create more heat. But if I have a few hours, 
I just set them in this warm spot. They will rise and get poofy in about an hour. You can definitely let them go a little bit longer than that. I want to take a break from these summer meals to tell you about today's video sponsor, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online natural and organic grocery store that makes it really easy and convenient to source ingredients that you need in your kitchen for a really great price and lots of options. I don't live in a town that has organic grocery stores and so there are certain things that I just can't find locally and if I do find them, they are really expensive. So for those items, I like to have a Thrive Market membership. Spices, einkorn products like einkorn flour and einkorn pasta, organic condiments, dried fruit. Thrive Market is membership based, so you can either pay month to month or for the entire year. You'll save a little bit of money if you do it for the entire year at one time, which is always the route that I've chosen. But if you just wanna get your feet wet and see what Thrive Market has for you in your kitchen, you can also try it monthly. I love that the Thrive Market website is organized by dietary preference. So if you are paleo, gluten-free, dairy-free, you can make it to where you only see the options that best fit your family's dietary needs. There is also a deals section on the website. So you can browse through that, see some things that are deeply discounted. Thrive Market offers free shipping on orders over $49. So for our family, I can get several staples all packaged together, delivered right to my door without that additional shipping cost. Thrive Market is offering Farmhouse On Moon viewers 30% off your first order, plus a free gift worth up to $60 by using my link, thrivemarket.com forward slash farmhouse on boon. It'll also be linked in the description box below. We are doing a backyard barbecue tonight. One of my favorite things to make and one of the reasons I'm real happy that we got the extra side burner on the grill is french fries. I know I make these all the time now. Again, I got the lard from my sister's farm. Frying can be messy if stuff pops out. So doing it outside is definitely the best place to do it. And of course, it's gonna pair very nicely with the sandwiches that we are making. It's quite optional to do an egg wash on the buns, but I do like the additional color. I love it whenever food can be delicious. Not very hard to tackle, something real easy to make like these buns, but then also very, very beautiful. So to do an egg wash, my preferred method, and this just depends on what I have. Sometimes I just use an egg white if the recipe calls for egg yolk, and I have a white left. In this case, I am doing an egg yolk and a little bit of water. That combination really brushes on nicely. I'm also going to sprinkle them with some sesame seeds. The kids really find these intriguing and delicious. They pick around where the ones that fell off the buns and eat those as well. So they're fun and of course they make it beautiful. If you want the printable version of this, it is over on the blog farmhouseonboon.com. Also, did I mention, I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but I'm writing a cookbook with all of my sourdough recipes, a physical book. I get asked about this a lot. So these will be featured in there as well. I also am adding, I'm in the process of adding all of the grams measurements to my recipes. I am totally a just dump cups of flour into the mixer type of person because it just feels very easy on a busy day. But I know there are some precise bakers and it's been a challenge because did you know there is a wide variety in what a cup of flour weighs based on how you measure it. So the way that I measure my cups of flour is by just scooping them down into the flour bag or canister, whatever it is you have, because that's fast. Whereas the precise method is to spoon each little bit of flour so it's nice and fluffy into a cup measurer. I do not have time for that. So my recipes, the cup weighs 140 grams. I figured this out by taking my cup measure and measuring it the way that I would get a cup of flour that I test my recipes with 10 different times and averaging it. I always got around 140, sometimes a little bit more, but I can pretty confidently say that at this point, that is the weight 
for a cup of flour on a farmhouse on boon recipe. I had my friend who also helps to write for the blog do the exact same thing over in her neck of the woods and she got 140 grams. So I'm sure we're using different flours. We're trying to come up with a standard here that we can then test all the recipes against before publishing them in the book. On the blog, you know, if things, if we feel that the changes need to be made based on feedback or new trials, of course, we can update them. But in the book format, these things have to be very nailed down. So that's something I've been working a lot on. My chicken's been marinating all day and I'm just gonna get it on the grill. Ever since my younger sister who has a farm has started selling boneless skinless breasts, I have been using them more. And some of you are probably like, wait, why aren't you making as many whole chickens like I've preached forever? Because whole chicken is flavorful, it's easy to make, it's also more budget friendly than cuts like boneless skinless chicken breasts, especially if you're sourcing them from a farm and they're pasture raised. For me in my current season of life, the convenience of having food like this that I can quickly get thawed out and on the grill is something that I'm willing to sacrifice some taste for. Now that's not to say that we aren't still doing a whole bunch of whole chickens. I actually have one in the fridge right now that I'm gonna throw in the oven later today. Still cooking a lot of whole chickens, but I have to say, I understand the convenience of these boneless, skinless breasts. And if they're cooked properly, not overcooked and dry, if they're marinated, they still are quite tasty. And they, of course, make the most delicious sandwich on a sourdough bun with some homemade mayo, sauerkraut, cheese, lettuce. So delicious. The perfect outdoor barbecue meal for a family. We just used the last bit of sauerkraut that we had on hand for this meal. I like to keep a lot of sauerkraut. I have found in the past that I really don't like making large batches. Now, if you're growing a lot in your garden or you come across a really good deal at a farmer's market, of course, you're going to want to make a large batch, but we do better, especially with refrigerator space and not letting the cabbage get brown, doing it in quantities that we're going to use it in a fairly quick amount of time. So usually that is about three heads of cabbage. I try to get this going about once every two or three weeks seems to be about perfect so that we always have sauerkraut. I've also learned over the years that I much prefer to rough cut the cabbage as opposed to putting it through the food processor. The taste is just a lot nicer that way it's a very quick straightforward it doesn't feel like this very huge process whereas something as small as getting out the food processor extra tools makes it a point of resistance to where i don't get it going as much as i would like to now my rule of thumb is about one tablespoon of salt per head of cabbage now i have some clips that actually were taken before we ate and then some after what i did was i got one head of cabbage or maybe two chopped up and into the pot with two tablespoons of salt and allowed that to sweat for a few hours while we were eating and cleaning up. It reduces down as it sweats and then I can fit the rest of the cabbage. So it's an overflowing pot of cabbage and then it ends up reducing down as it sweats so I can add the third and final. Now I meant to add caraway seeds because that is my favorite way to consume sauerkraut is with a little bit of caraway. I reach into the cupboard and pulled out cumin seed. The reason that I'm not used to having to look at the label is because I never keep cumin seed, I just keep ground cumin, but I bought cumin seed for cheese 
and it didn't occur to me when I reached into the cupboard to read the labels. I just reached for what looked like the normal seed that I throw in my cabbage since I'm actually making this voiceover much later. We've already been eating the sauerkraut with the cumin. It definitely tastes better with things like tacos because cumin is a seasoning that you expect with tacos, but we've been eating it with everything, no matter what. The kids don't like it as much, unfortunately. So six of my seven children really like sauerkraut. They don't like it with the cumin. So I think it's just gonna be me and Luke eating it until we go back to our caraway seed sauerkraut. Before I move on to telling you about the next thing I'm making, I'll give you a couple more tips on sauerkraut. I use a weight to keep it below the brine and fermenting lids. Also make sure to pack it in extremely tight. You don't want any air in there. That's what helps to prevent mold. You want everything to stay below the brine, packed tightly. I always put it in a baking dish because it leaks out of the top. And so you want to make sure that while it's sitting in your pantry or wherever it's sitting to ferment, it does not leak all over the place. If you're wanting to get started with fermenting sauerkraut, I was sent a kit by a viewer that has the kraut stomper, the weights, and the lids all in one pack. So it's really convenient. You can find that linked in my Amazon shop. So that's amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash farmhouse on Boone. I will try to leave a link for that as well below. Now I am making some sourdough breadsticks. These pair really nicely with a salad. So if you wanna make a salad for dinner, which I like to do, even for little kids, if you have little kids who don't really like salad, they can eat all of the toppings, whether it's hard boiled eggs or chicken or cheese, a breadstick. There's lots for them to consume and then the adults get to enjoy a nice big salad with a homemade dressing. For these breadsticks, I did them just like the burger buns where I allowed them to ferment for several hours and then did a shape, rise, and bake. Then I topped them with butter, garlic powder, and salt. Sometimes I make a garlic butter for these with fresh garlic, but today I just sprinkled them with salt and garlic powder, and honestly, the kids like them even better than the fresh garlic, of course, right? I am gathering some homegrown cilantro for a cilantro vinaigrette that tastes just delicious on the salad with steak. Who doesn't love steak? Oh my word, my sister, her beef is grass fed, but then she does grain finish with non-GMO grain, and that is my preference. It's kind of the best of both worlds because you get all the grass fed, then you don't have to worry about the GMO in the grain, but it still has the fat component that a steer finished out on grain. I know this is controversial, so I understand there will be a lot of comments about this. This is definitely my preference. We have been getting grass-fed and grass-finished beef for years. And I definitely can tell a difference even when they do everything right. It's still, I don't know. I like both options. Let's just put it that way. My biggest thing is wanting to avoid the GMOs that traditional beef is raised with. This is not. So it, it gets all of that fat. It's just like melt in your mouth delicious. The steaks from this. I like to cook my steaks pretty rare. So I know some of you probably like them a little bit more well done, but I definitely like them to still be red. For my cilantro vinaigrette, I am doing cilantro, olive oil, apple cider vinegar, garlic, salt, and some cream. This is really, really, really delicious, especially on the salad with all of the summer flavors. So I added some fresh strawberries, some avocado, we didn't have any fresh corn, but I think whenever corn is more in season, I would love to put some fresh corn on top of a salad like this and then topped it with the steak and the cilantro vinaigrette and paired it with breadsticks. My kids, when I cook steak this way, as long as it's not too tough, they can eat it and they absolutely love it. One of my daughters recently discovered how much she liked steak. She just thought that only adults really like steak, but she has now come to believe that it is the most delicious meat of all, which we all know. On this particular day, my kids were having over a bunch of friends for the morning, so I knew I needed to get 
something in the oven that could bake for a while all through the morning and then be ready for lunchtime without me giving any more attention to it. Also turns out that a few kids stayed after the event was over. And so it's a good thing that I did two whole chickens, lots of veggies, and really made a large sheet pan dinner so that way we could feed a lot of kids. Now I am doing a spatchcock on both of these chickens, which basically just means that I am splitting it down the back and then laying it flat. This helps it to cook a little bit more evenly. So instead of a lot of times when you cook a chicken whole, there are certain parts that will be very overly done and then certain parts that won't be quite done. This just lays it all flat so it's all getting the same chance to get cooked. So it cooks faster and more evenly. Adding Brussels sprouts, onions, carrots, potatoes, lots of seasonings and oil and salt, and then just throwing this in the oven for all morning. What could be easier than a sheet pan dinner and actually very, very delicious as well. This is one of those types of meals I like to have in my arsenal so that we don't have to go get takeout. As long as I have some meat thawed out in the refrigerator, I'm stocked with various vegetables, even if it's just in the freezer or root vegetables that are long lasting, keeping a lot of those on hand. This is something I could throw together really easily. As I'm watching this, I remember that I also drizzled it with some honey and topped it with fresh sage. So no recipe, just what you have. I had some honey on the back of the stove because my honey was crystallized and I had to heat it up for something. So it was sitting there just waiting to be thrown onto something and this seemed like the perfect opportunity to use that honey up, get some fresh herbs on here. Most of my kids really actually love Brussels sprouts. They are quite tasty. Meals like this really prove the point that cooking from scratch doesn't have to be time consuming. It can be, and you can have fun with creating new and different recipes. But if you are in a season of survival where you're trying to figure out how you can feed your family healthy meals without spending all day in the kitchen, throw together a bunch of sheet pan dinners. They take virtually no time at all, just all the time to cook. As long as you have some meat thought out, you're stocked up with your meat and your veggies, you can throw something together really quick. Tonight, I'm going to get some meatballs going. Again, if the meat is thawed out in the refrigerator, which is a habit I try to get in in the beginning of the week, just stocking my fridge with all of the meat we could possibly need for the week. It's thawed out. I can so fast throw together some meatballs like this. So I took ground beef, a couple eggs, a little flour, some fresh sage from the garden. I think I might have also done a little bit of basil or thyme. I don't know, whatever herbs. Salt, a little garlic powder, then just combine it all, roll them into balls, get them in my pan and in the oven while I'm on to other things. I like anything that's very hands-off like this. I am making the kind of pasta sauce I make when I realize I don't have any made spaghetti sauce on hand. I like to keep spaghetti sauce on hand because it makes for a quick and easy dinner. But whenever I have a can of tomato paste and flour and butter and cream, I first make a roux with a bit of butter and flour. I then add in cream and tomato paste. I blend it up with the immersion blender and then cook it until it's thick. 
I'll add some salt, garlic powder. Sometimes I have to thin it down with milk. And I always add a little bit of sugar. If you keep a nice stock of good quality pasta, good quality meat, a few pantry staples, a meal like this, again, comes together very, very easily. have a little extra time so I'm going to get going some sourdough pizza. This is the pizza dough. So I have my discard pizza crust which basically just means that I heat up a stone or a cast iron skillet really really hot, spread sourdough discard over it. It gets instantly cooked. I add some olive oil, salt, pepper or whatever herbs I have. That makes for a really fast one. This dough is something that I get going in advance and then I either let it rise and make it later that day. So I let it rise for you know six hours or whatever, make it later that day. Or I put it into the refrigerator in something airtight and then use it whenever. And that's what I did today. I don't remember how many days after this that I actually ended up making the pizzas, but I like to just mix it up in the mixer, knead it for a good long while till it passes the window pane test. I've talked about that on here before. Basically, it's nice and stretchy and smooth and glossy. Allow it to sit at room temperature for about six hours so it can do that like bulk ferment at room temperature. Then put it in the fridge for up to a week. Then while the mixer is dirty, I get going another thing. In today's case, I made up a batch of my whole wheat sandwich loaf, which is a mixture of whole wheat flour and all-purpose flour. There's also 100% whole wheat over on the blog, but you can do anything. You could get some buns going or brioche and let them do that ferment at the room temp and then get all of it in the fridge, label it, and then pull it out whenever you're ready to do it. This is a great way to streamline sourdough. I'm also getting going some cheese today. Again, the pizzas aren't being made today, but I want to have the mozzarella cheese and the crust while I have some extra time in the kitchen. It's a really good thing to make up a bunch of things that I'm gonna feel overwhelmed with later so I can have this from scratch meal whenever I have time. It is time to divide, shape, rise, and bake my sandwich loaves. We rely heavily on things like this all throughout the summer. I take my kids berry picking to the pool. We do a lot of activities in the summertime. I just really like to do all that kind of stuff. For some of you, that's real stressful. For some of you, you know, you like to get out of the house. And so you need a lot of meals that are easy to throw together. I'm also throwing together a chicken salad so that we can go to the pool. So I'm doing leftover chicken that I had from a different time celery, raisins, cause I'm out of grapes. I like to put grapes in chicken salad, but I didn't have it. Homemade fermented mayo, and then just serving it with my sandwich loaves. All right, this is what my pizza dough looks like after sitting in the refrigerator for a few days. Nice and bubbly and ready to go. Of course, it is cold. I will divide it and then just allow it to sit for a very short time at room temperature, or maybe not even at all in this case. I don't remember what I did. But I know that we had a quick meal this evening because of the prior meal prep. It's really nice to have stuff like this on hand for that Friday or Saturday night pizza night if you have a tradition like that. We did a mixture of mozzarella cheese and my homemade butter cheese. And then I also, when I made the mozzarella, I had made some homemade ricotta, which just basically after you strain the curds from the whey, you cook the whey on low heat for a while, and then you strain that through a cheesecloth and ricotta appears. It's amazing. You end up with very little waste there. So it's something that I really love making with all of the milk that we're getting from our cows. 
and then it tastes great on one of these pizza crusts, I spread some of the ricotta on almost like a sauce. We didn't have sauce this evening, so I was kind of relying on like fig jam for a fig jam, prosciutto, bacony, cheesy pizza. And then also I did some with just the ricotta, almost like a base or a sauce, and then some with a combination of both. So this one here has the fig jam, the ricotta, and then some cheese, prosciutto, I don't know, but it all tasted delicious and I was very proud because this was all homemade cheese. Now, we still use store-bought cheese, but it's fun because this is my newest hobby and this has a combination of three different types of cheeses. I cook my pizza dough on a preheated stone or skillet. This helps the crust to rise nicely and get crispy, makes for a wonderful pizza night. summertime family meal inspiration. As always, if you're brand new, I would really appreciate if you'd hit that subscribe. I make a new video every week on food from scratch, natural living, and our handmade home here in our farmhouse.